as you can see on this slide, this is the purpose statement of Minnesota APSI. My name is Brian Bajan and I'm a program manager with LifeWorks Services overseeing our South Metro employment team. I've served on the Minnesota APSI board since 2018 and I'm a part of the public policy committee and community engagement committees. And I wanna tell you a little bit about what our four committees do. So our public policy committee tracks and influences state and national policies on employment for people with disabilities. Our conference and training committee coordinates trainings and conferences such as this one around Minnesota's needs for employment first information. Our communications committee spreads the word of employment first through targeted social media efforts and has recently expanded into podcasting. So that's pretty cool. And our community engagement committee meets with different stakeholder groups to spread the mission of APSI and provide accurate information about employment first policies. So as I said, I serve on the Community Engagement Committee and I have to say it's really exciting when we participate in um, transition school resource fairs and I get a chance to talk with young people and their parents um, about the uh, possibilities of employment in their future and get young people excited about working and taking that next step uh, towards adulthood once they leave school. If you're interested in joining any of these committees and or would like to learn more about their efforts, um, you can email us at minnesotaapsi at, at gmail.com or you can visit our website mnapsi.org. Um, we would love to have, um, have you join our committees and our efforts in uh, moving forward with Employment First. And with that, I'll turn it over to our presenter. Wendy? Okay. Um, yes. Hello. My name is Wendy DeVoer, and I'm with uh, Career Ventures Incorporated. Uh, I am the CEO and Program Director of uh, Career Ventures Incorporated, and I am also a certified sign language interpreter, and I've been working in, in the field of deafness and vocational rehabilitation for about 30 years now. Okay, thank you, Wendy. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us on this snowy day, as Danielle said. Um, <clears throat> my name is Christine Marble, and I am currently with Vocational Rehabilitation Services. I, our office is located out of the St. Paul office. Uh, I'm with the Deaf and Hard of Hearing Unit. I've been an interpreter and in the field of vocational rehabilitation for coming up on 25 years. Worked in various capacities. Um, and we're happy to have the opportunity here today to talk to you all. Um, what I want to start off by saying is that in our uh, PowerPoint presentation, we have a lot of information. We've chalked it full. I know that it will be sent out to everybody after. I think Danielle will be sending it out to everybody afterwards. There are a lot of links that are in here that provide more information for you. We're not gonna be able to cover everything that's on the PowerPoint within the time that we have. Uh, we're gonna try to hit some of the highlights. And then of course, if you have questions afterwards, uh, don't hesitate to contact Wendy or I. Um, the topics that we're gonna be covering today are some, we're gonna hopefully create some awareness of some of the barriers and challenges in accessing remote technology in this uh, COVID pandemic remote world that we're all trying to navigate. Um, it's difficult enough to navigate things, um, but when you have a hearing loss, it makes it even more challenging. We're going to go over briefly some of the current trends and technology that are used by people with a hearing loss. It's not going to be an exhaustive list. We're going to try to touch on the, the uh, video platforms and apps that are most popular at this time. Um, and then toward the end of the uh, presentation, Wendy is going to give some uh, real life examples on how to adjust some of the technology that we've talked about and adjusting communication approaches 
when you're serving people who have a hearing loss. Um, as Danielle said, please feel free to make comments or ask questions, take advantage of the chat box, the Q&A. We're going to try to monitor that. It's sometimes uh, difficult to do while you're presenting, um, but we're gonna do the best that we can. <clears throat> and we'll be answering questions at the end as well. And again, like I mentioned, if there are any questions that come up afterwards, uh, after the webinar, please don't hesitate to contact us. Our uh, contact information is on the previous two slides. So I want to lay a groundwork um, about the definitions uh, of types of hearing loss. Quite often we hear the term hearing impaired or hard of hearing or deaf and you know you, you might wonder what's the appropriate use. Um, so I just wanted to go over some of that. So if a person identifies as hard of hearing or having a hearing loss, um, they're going to rely primarily on listening to understand spoken communication. Um, and this person is likely going to be augmenting with speech reading um, in taking in any visual cues such as facial expressions and body language. A person who identifies as deaf, sometimes you'll hear the term culturally deaf, um, they're relying primarily on sign language to communicate and to access um, any communication. A person who identifies as deafblind, um, if, if they're experiencing a dual sensory loss of both hearing and vision. Now, there's a wide variety of um, hearing loss and vision loss, as you know. And so th this, is a, this could be a, a three to four hour presentation in and of itself. So I'm not gonna go too in depth into um, the definition of deafblind or serving deafblind, but Wendy will be providing a, an example later on. So this is a slide that I do wanna take some time on. Um, as you probably have all been seeing in, in the media, they've been talking about how masks make it difficult to communicate um, and it just exacerbates it for a person who has a hearing loss and is relying on speech reading. Um, just gonna get my notes out here, make sure that I cover everything. So when you are wearing a mask, um, depending on the type of mask, because there are cloth masks, there are, in fact, I have a couple here, um, transparent masks. This is one. And then this is another one. This is a popular one that people uh, use because it, it still provides a lot of access um, to speech reading. There's a little bit of a glare, um, but you can probably see, um, and you're supposed to put it down tight like this, and you can probably hear that it's not as clear. My voice is probably not as clear, but it does provide that access. What I will say um, in all seriousness, when you're wearing one of these, it, it almost feels like you've got a shower curtain over your face. Um, and one of the, the cons of wearing a, a transparent mask like that is that it can fog up pretty easily. Um, there are anti-fog sprays that are out there that you can use in order. Um, so those can be helpful. Getting back to what I was saying, when you're wearing a mask, if you're wearing a mask, such as the transparent mask, that's going to decrease the decibel level even more. If you're wearing a cloth mask, it'll certainly decrease the decibel level, maybe not as much as with a plastic mask. However, um, then they don't have access to speech reading or facial expressions. Um, the decibel level could be uh, reduced up to five decibels. Um, and then moving on to the next bullet point, you see plexiglass when, as you are going out in some retail stores, you see that they have plexiglass up as an additional barrier to prevent um, COVID spread. Well, that plexiglass is another layer of, of a reduction of decibels. Um, in addition to the fact that when you're in real retail stores, quite often, 
You'll hear background noise, environmental noise, such as fans or music, HVAC systems going on, whether it's a heater or uh, an air conditioner. And those provide additional challenges to any given listening situation. Um, video conferencing platforms, I just wanna to touch on this. We're using Zoom today. Um, there are other video conferencing platforms and I'll be talking a little bit more about them um, in detail a little bit later. Um, some will have embedded captioning. Um, and I'll talk about the difference between captioning and ASR, speech to text recognition or ASR meaning automatic speech recognition in a little bit. Uh, people who are tech savvy can use their smartphone with uh, the voice to text apps or the speech to text apps. Um, and then one other thing that I wanted to mention about the hearing aids is that when we're wearing masks, if you have a hearing aid and then you pull the mask off, oftentimes what people are experiencing is that it either pulls out their hearing aid or it pulls it completely off and it falls to the ground that can cause damage. Um, so there's a lot to take into consideration. Uh, moving over to the next column under people who identify as deaf, masks are going to be a, the same thing. Um, they're, they generally will augment with speech reading, but even if they don't, it blocks all sorts of facial expression. We've been hearing on the news and you know people have been talking about how you can't see if people are smiling. It's hard to tell that. Um, the video conferencing platforms, if you are having a meeting with a person who is deaf uh, through Zoom or Microsoft Teams or Google Meets, whatever it is, um, the deaf person is generally going to pin the interpreter. An interpreter would be best. The gallery view doesn't work very well because the thumbnail size, depending on how many people are on the meeting, the thumbnail size can get down to be really tiny. And then you can't see sign language or hand movements going. Um, of course, the quality of video is gonna play, play in there um, and the placement of the person. I know Wendy's gonna talk about this a little bit later, um, but if you've ever seen people who have their video like this and that's all you're seeing, that's not very helpful. They really need to see your whole face um, and even part of your body. Um, for people who identify as deafblind, social distancing has been a huge issue, especially if they are relying on what we call tactile sign language. Um, tactile sign language is when you are signing into the hand of the other person. Um, it requires that you physically be there to interpret. Um, and again, with video conferencing, depending on the vision loss that they have, um, they may still be able to access a video conference, um, but if we, if during the course of the meeting, people turn off and on their video, that can change and move where the placement of the people are. And it's very difficult for the person um, who has that vision loss to try to track where everybody is. Um, and again, with interpreters, they might physically need to be there uh, versus just providing them remotely. Okay, so moving on to some current trends and technology. We, again, we've talked about the masks and some of the ASR um, pros and cons, video conferencing. A um, Couple of things that I wanted to point out, there are some other technology options that you can get your hands on that might be helpful if you're serving a person with a hearing loss, especially if they identify as hard of hearing. One of which is a, just a simple microphone. It could be a Bluetooth microphone or a hardwired microphone, which is like the, the graphic that we have at the top of this um, slide. The reason that can be very helpful is, say for example, you are having, you're in an intake with a person who has a hearing loss. You could take that microphone and simply, um, you know, plug it into their cell phone um, and then have the, the microphone near your face. And the advantage to that is that if you're, if you're just talking like I'm talking right now, hopefully everybody is hearing me just fine. Um, <clears throat> but my voice is having, having to travel from my mouth 
to the speaker on the on my computer. In this situation, if you're going to use a speech to text app, instead of having your voice have it travel all that distance, your voice would only have to travel to where the microphone is. Some of you may have headphones with a microphone. And again, that would be the same type of advantage. I'm not going to turn it on now because it, it can potentially mess things up. But again, the voice is only having to travel that inch or inch and a half versus the full distance. Um, continuing on with hitting some of the highlights, we're going to, I'm going to be talking about some video apps uh, a little bit later on. I would, I would like to highlight that for people who are deaf, when you hire an interpreter, that is of great benefit to them. There's a misconception out there that you might think, well, I could just hire a captionist or we can just use captioning or I can type back and forth. But for people who are culturally deaf, English is not their first language and American Sign Language is not English put onto the hands. Um, the grammatical structure and syntax of ASL is much more closely related to um, the French language actually. So providing captioning is not necessarily the way to go especially if ASL is their native language. And then moving over to the next column for people who are deafblind, there's a recent emphasis in the last handful of years of doing pro-tactile, providing pro-tactile sign language, which is uh, a way of providing um, signs and symbols on a person's back or on a person's leg to, to um, give them environmental cues as to what's happening. If uh, people are laughing or crying or yawning. Um, that's protactile is, is the way to do that. I want to go back to the uh, hard of hearing column and talk a little bit about CART services. Um, CART services is um, communication access real time. And that's where you would bring in maybe potentially hire a captionist especially if you have a person who has just gotten a new job and is on um, an orientation. It's word for word and it's accurate. And for a person who identifies as hard of hearing, um, uh, English is going to be their, their native language. The FM system, system simulation is something that I would actually like to just show you right now. It's a six minute video and it gives you, there are a ton of different types of FM systems that are out there. Um, there are Bluetooth systems, there's hardwired FM systems. Um, and if you have any questions on that afterwards, please don't hesitate to ask me. But I just want to give this simulation and, and um, show you the benefit of what an FM simulation or what an FM system could provide. So let me get that queued up. Here we go. Hey, Chris, this is Danielle. Yes. Do you have the, is the video on a different screen on your computer than the PowerPoint? I'm sorry, say that again. Is the video on a different screen than the PowerPoint on your computer? Um, oh, are you not seeing the video? We are not, no. And I think what you may okay. have to do is end the screen share for the PowerPoint and then share the screen that has the video on. Got it. And when, and when you do that, when you choose the screen, make sure you check a box at the bottom that says that you want to link the audio as well so that we can hear it. Okay. Yep, so stop share for the PowerPoint. There you go. Okay. Sorry about this, bear with me, everybody. That's all right.
here. I thought this was going to be easy. I'm trying to share this screen, but I'm not sure this may not work. Are you seeing it we now? We see the video. Yep. Okay, great. Thank you very much. We, we can't hear the video. When you shared it, did you check that box that said that you wanted the audio to also be shared? Shoot. We're gonna run out of time here. Well, I tell you what, let's do this. Maybe I won't share the video right now. The video is, you can see the video. Um, I mean, we're, the, there's a link to the video on the um, on the PowerPoint. I'm just going to go back to sharing our screen here. Perfect. And when you are done with your part of the presentation, you can also put a link for the video in the chat. So those who want to maybe watch it right after the presentation are able to do that. Great. Okay. I will do that. Are you able to see my screen now with yep, the, we, the slide? Okay. Yep, we can see it. Sorry about that, everybody. Everybody, We're all learning technology. So <clears throat> um, basically what the FM system simulation does is it shows uh, the benefit of, of an FM system and um, how it can work in a, an ideal situation, a quiet situation. Um, and then it compares to how it can sound um, in a more challenging listening, situ listening situation when you have people talking in the background or coughing or laughing in the background, that can be very challenging. Um, so please do watch that video later. It's, it's an illuminating video and I apologize for not being able to get that to work. Okay. Moving on to some of the um, popular speech to text apps. Um, again, this is not an exhaustive list. There are definitely other uh, ASR, ASR apps that are out there that you may know of. Um, these are just the ones that are generally most popular with the, the people that we have been working with who have a hearing loss. Um, so just a, a couple of highlights here, live transcribe. It is currently known as one of the best ASRs that is out there. Part of the advantage to live transcribe, well, let me back up. One of the cons to live transcribe is that it is only Android compatible. Um, one of the pros to it though, is that it is a free download. It has large print. Um, it's, it's quick, it keeps up. It has a fair, a high degree of accuracy, and it also has black, excuse me, white print on black. And you'll see that our PowerPoint is generally all white print on black. Um, Wendy will be explaining a little bit later why we have it that way, um, but it does, it stands out a little bit more, especially if you are dealing with a person who has uh, vision loss as well as a hearing loss. You can get live transcribed through uh, on an Apple product, but there's a, as you see, a, a monthly charge to it. Ava, um, and I don't know that I have this on here, but Ava can be a very um, good program to have uh, for people who have uh, speech issues as well, because it does both speech to text as well as text to speech. It's a decent sized print, fairly close to live transcribe, um, but it is black print on a white background uh, like you would normally see. Um, and then Otter AI is also a, a fairly popular one that people have been using. 
um, you get the first 600 minutes free and then there's a cost based on minutes after that. So that's something to, to look into. And again, if you have a need to download any of these while you're working with a person who has a hearing loss um, and you're having any issues, don't hesitate to contact us. Moving on to some of the video conferencing platforms, obviously we're using Zoom right now. Um, most people are familiar with Zoom. There's no captioning option on Zoom currently. I did hear that they are working on that uh, because I believe that that's been a popular request. You can, solutions to that, that would be one, to hire a cart captionist, uh, but there's a, a cost that comes to that. Um, you can also, um, what I've done in the past with people that I've been working with is that if they have a hearing loss and they're having difficulty, um, one, I would use that headphone uh, to help that along. But then two, I will help them download either live transcribe or one of the other apps. So then they can put it on their phone and hold it up to the computer speaker and then it will transcribe for them. That can be a very helpful tool. Um, Google Meet has an ASR option, a captioning option as well. Um, Google Slides, GoToMeeting, MS Teams also has an ASR option and that's been a pretty popular one lately as well. I would say that again, it's, it's easy to see because it's white on black. Um, the, the accuracy for that particular one is, is um, maybe not as high. And I mentioned before that I wanted to talk a little bit about the difference between actual captioning and then this ASR, the, the speech recognition. We call it captioning, we call it a captioning option uh, because that is essentially how it functions. But when you have captioning, if you were to hire a cart captionist, it's an, an actual person, a live person who would be captioning everything word for word live. And so you have an extremely high amount of accuracy with that. That can be done either in person or remotely. Um, <clears throat> The captioning options that are embedded within, such as with MS Teams, it's a, it's a software and so it's, it's fallible. Um, better than nothing is what I will say about that. It, it's, but it's, it's decent. I just used it the other day. Okay. Now, I don't know how familiar people are with these uh, video apps. Again, not an exhaustive list. It's just these are the ones that are popular. And by the way, everything that you see on our PowerPoint that is highlighted in red is a link. Um, so you should be able to later on go back and, and capture those and check them out. The first three on here, Google Duo, FaceTime, and IMO, they are all what we call real time. Um, and I'm sure you know what I mean by that. It's live. Most people have experienced FaceTime by now or Google Duo, um, which is used popularly by Android users. Um, it's real time, it's, it's like this. The latter two, Marco Polo and Glide, um, it's more like a, a text. You video yourself um, signing or saying something and then you send it and then the person can respond, but it isn't live. Um, and so, uh, again, if you have questions about using those or you're wanting to download one or you want to know what questions to ask of the person that you're working with ahead of time to know which one to download or which one to use, um, please don't hesitate to reach out and ask us. Okay, so with this base of uh, apps and video conferencing. Hopefully that gave you a, a good base of information in terms of uh, some of the popular technologies that are out there. Um, I know I didn't answer all questions. And if there are questions in the chat, just uh, let me know and I'll try to answer those while Wendy is uh, presenting. And she's going to take over and give you some real life examples on how to apply some of this technology and adjust some of your communication techniques. Uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you for um, laying down the, the groundwork in talking about uh, the different types of technology uh, that individuals are using. 
Um, and I just wanted to mention that some of this technology has been in use um, with individuals with the hearing loss um, before the pandemic, but um, more so now um, because of social distancing. I, I just realized that I forgot to mention um, at the beginning of my introduction, um, the main population that we work with uh, at Career Ventures Incorporated are individuals uh, who are deaf, hard of hearing, deaf blind, um, blind and low vision. So that's uh, primarily um, the, the people that we work with. And uh, so what I'm going to do now is talk about how we can apply the different types of technology and approaches in working um, with someone with a hearing loss uh, in person and then remotely. And we'll move on to the next slide. Okay, so I'd like to start off with an individual who is hard of hearing. And um, actually this is uh, an example. We have a, a student, a transition student, um, 17 years old, hard of hearing, uh, wears a hearing aid, does not use sign language, and um, is actually meeting with one of our staff remotely. So our staff was meeting with this individual um, in person at their high school, uh, but since the pandemic started, now are meeting remotely. So if you are going to meet with someone um, in person, it would be ideal if you could send the agenda ahead of time and which I'm sure these are some of the things you probably already do, um, even with individuals that don't have a hearing loss. Uh, but it would be helpful to send that agenda ahead of time so they know what the, the topics are going to be and any related paperwork. Then um, once you're in person, to have the agenda um, printed out uh, for all participants and uh, the paperwork that, that you will be going over as well. Now, for an individual that's hard of hearing, um, it's, it's critical that you meet in a quiet room. And if you do get a chance, please do go back and watch that video with the, um, the, with the simulation because it, it really um, drives home the point how uh, hearing aids, what all they really do is amplify sound. So if someone is speaking and there's a fan that's going on in the background and people are chatting in the background. It doesn't pinpoint a certain sound. It actually amplifies all of those sounds. And so um, you can imagine if someone has a hearing loss and they're trying to um, listen to what you're saying, their, their mind is having to compete uh, with all those extra sounds. So if you can find a quiet place, um, lighting is also critical. Uh, sometimes um, if you have if you have a window behind you and the the shades are up and there's a bright sunlight coming through that could um, uh, that individual is not able to see your face and again they're going to need access to um, your face and they're going to try to get information from your mouth movements and things like that so you want to sit where your face is more lit and not lit from the back. Also, uh, lamps and lights in the in behind you can also um, be distracting. Of course, when you're meeting in person, if you have it available, um, a transparent mask uh, is also helpful. I know that when I go out to meet with individuals, whether they have a hearing loss uh, or if they are deaf, you know, I'll wear the transparent mask. It is not comfortable for me but I cannot tell you how often uh, they have thanked me. When they see me walk in with that mask, their eyes light up and they're like, that's nice. Um, because now they can actually um, see my entire face. But you do have to remember to speak up because those plastic masks um, lower your decibels. And then you can ask if they have a mobile device or an assisted listening device that can help uh, with communication. You can also use um, the speech recognition app um, to help uh, with that as well. It's critical that if there are more than two people at the meeting, um, that everyone uh, would wait until someone is done speaking before the next person um, speaks. 
uh, if everyone speaks over one another, that individual with the hearing loss will be lost. And sometimes they don't feel confident enough um, to speak up and say that they've, they've lost what's being said. So uh, it's critical that you um, do some turn taking. Now, if you are meeting remotely, uh, so again, we'll go back to this uh, individual who's uh, 17 years old. Again, it would be helpful to send the agenda ahead of time and any related paperwork. The next critical thing is to determine what type of video conferen conferencing format that you will be using. So for this individual, um, they actually use Google Meets. And the reason why the student likes to use Google Meets is it has the ASR, uh, the speech recognition, um, again, this individual does not sign. What has happened is while they're meeting with um, the staff person, um, the, the student's um, mother uh, walked into the back uh, behind them. She walked into the room along with her sister and they were having a conversation. Well, what happened is the ASR picked up what they were saying and all of a sudden the student was able to read what his family members were talking about. So if he, and he got all excited and he's like, whoa, wait a minute. And he turns around and then he actually joined in on their conversation. So if that ASR wasn't available and they came in from behind and started chatting, he would hear that there's some noise, but he never would have understood what they were saying. So it just be aware of that. It does pick up other conversation that's going on in a room too. Um, but he really appreciated that. So that's the, the Google Meets is the format of his choice. If you have, have it available, um, you know, the headset with the microphone, um, one that Chris just showed. So the staff person wears that because it amplifies their voice. You also need to consider the, um, the tech savviness of the individual you're working with. So if you're going to be using like Zoom and typically in order to access Zoom, you have to send a link and you can text the link or you can email it. Well, you have to make sure that the individual knows how to access email or a text message. You know, there's extra steps that Zoom um, requires. Whereas uh, something like Google Duo or FaceTime, um, it's live and it's basically like an app on their phone or iPad. So it's just more of a one-step process. So, and I'm sure you already are dealing with that with the um, person serves that you are working with. And again, it's um, critical that you take, turn, uh, take turns for speaking, especially on a remote um, setup because it can get very confusing um, if people are talking over one, and, uh, over one another. The other thing in um, meeting with someone who has a hearing loss or a vision loss is to identify who's speaking. So for example, if we were in a meeting and I wanted to say something, I would say, this is Wendy. And then I would move on and say what I needed to say. So this helps the individual to um, know who it is that's speaking and um, it also slows communication down just a bit. As Chris mentioned earlier, especially with someone with a hearing loss, it's, it's also important that they have access to your entire face. So you've probably sat in some of those um, remote uh, video meetings where um, when a person comes online, all you see are their eyes, uh, maybe the top of their forehead, and if everyone can hear, that, that works. But for someone who has a hearing loss, they actually need access to your entire face. So make sure that your camera is positioned um, so that they, can, that they can see you. And again, they will be accessing any um, mouthing movements and stuff that they can along with what they can hear. The other piece to remember is the, the type of background. Um, Chris mentioned, um, you know, for individuals who are deaf or deaf blind, we typically wear um, dark or solid um, colored clothing. And that is also true for the background. So think about anything that's like um, audio noise, anything in the background that could be distracting. 
and visually distracting. So the less amount of visual noise that you can have going on um, is helpful. And I know there are virtual backgrounds and that works perfectly if the person doesn't have a, a hearing loss and they don't rely on accessing um, information visually. But as you notice, sometimes when you're moving with the uh, virtual background, it kind of distorts the movement. So that could just be another visual noise for that person to contend with. Okay, so that's a little bit about when uh, working with an individual who is hard of hearing. I would now like to move on to um, an individual who is deaf. And uh, this individual that you see here on the screen, his name is Omar. And um, he was actually just recently featured on APSI's Why I Work series. Um, Omar is deaf and relies on sign language for communication and is uh, an immigrant from Mexico. He's been in the United States now for about five years. So English um, is not uh, very accessible for him, you know, written uh, in, in, uh, in a written or reading form, format. And um, Spanish is not also accessible for him at this time. So ASL is his primary mode of communication. Uh, with Omar, uh, he wanted to, we helped him um, find a job. He wanted to work in a restaurant. That was his dream job. And uh, we, we found him uh, some employment at uh, Chick-fil-A, which was even within walking distance from his home. And he was thrilled about it. His family was thrilled. And they just loved him uh, at the interview. He's just a very charming and um, endearing young man. Well, as luck would have it, his first day that he was supposed to start is um, the when the stay at home order uh, went through uh, due to the pandemic. And so they said all things have to be put on hold and we'll, we'll touch base with you in the future. We'll see how things go. Well, of course, I was a little bit worried for him because you know how that goes. Sometimes in the when they say that in the future, um, it doesn't happen. But fortunately, um, in May, when as the stay at home order began to lift, they contacted him immediately and said, please come on in. So he has been working there since and he's doing a great job. Now, if you were, for example, going to meet with um, Omar, if you were to have an in-person in -person meeting, um, yes, it would be helpful to send the agenda out ahead of time, um, but also remember that English is not his first language and he, he's not able to even access written um, or spoken Spanish at this point. So for someone like Omar, it might be helpful. You might have some icons um, or some pictures related to the topics you're going to be talking about and maybe with a, a simple um, sentence and then that can be explained more once in person. Um, because he does use a sign language interpreter, uh, you'll need to set up for a sign language interpreter and it takes about two weeks in advance or more. So if you wanted to meet with someone who needs a sign language interpreter like tomorrow, um, you might be able to get one, but uh, chances are very remote. So the sooner the better. Uh, and then also lighting is important, just as we spoke about before. If you've got, if you're backlit, it makes it hard for the individual to see you or the interpreter. So the interpreter, the sign language interpreter is going to be seated next to you. And uh, so the individual, the deaf individual will sit across from you and the interpreter. Now in a spoken language, with a spoken language interpreter, it's the opposite. The spoken language interpreter usually sits side by side with the individual that needs the interpreter. And then they just, um, you know, they may speak into their ear and then they, they uh, interpret back and forth. Whereas with the sign language interpreter, the interpreter needs to sit next to you or whoever is speaking so that the deaf individual can watch both of you at the same time. So the setup is different than if it was a spoken language interpreter. 
Um, also, you'll want to wear a transparent mask. So again, so they can access um, all visual information. Turn taking is also critical. I, I do want to back up when I talked about the agenda and all related paperwork. Um, you also want to make sure that the interpreter can get that ahead of time as well so that they can prepare uh, for the assignment. Now, if you are meeting with um, an individual remotely, again, you do the same thing, send out the agenda and paperwork ahead of time. You would still need to secure your ASL interpreter. Uh, so the amount of time still applies. And again, you'll need to determine what type of video conferencing that you will use. So um, Omar is, he does have experience with Zoom and he does have experience with Google Meets, but again, those require um, links to access. Uh, his, his preference is Google, Google Duo because he can just access it on his phone and there's no extra steps. Um, again, you'll have to consider lighting as you would if, when you're meeting with someone who's hard of hearing, um, turn taking, you identify who's speaking, and what um, Omar may actually do in a remote um, setting or in someone who's deaf is they may, they'll probably, they might pin the interpreter um, on their screen if there's more than, if there's more than two of you meeting. And then that way, all they have to do is just watch the interpreter and not watch all the other hearing people that are speaking. So it will depend, um, on what their preference is, but they may just end up penning the interpreter. And then again, the background is important um, as with the individual who's hard of hearing. Okay, so now what I'd like to do is move on to, uh, to someone who is deaf blind. And this one gets to be a little bit more um, uh, uh, challenging, especially with the pandemic. And we'll move on to the next slide. Okay, uh, these are actually um, Angelica and AJ. These are nationally known individuals. They're both deaf blind and they use tactile communication. So hand over hand uh, for communication. And they are kind of the developers or the founder of the pro tactile um, ASL form of communication that Chris was talking about. Um, but I just wanted to throw that up there and uh, just recognize um, their, their contribution to the deafblind community. So these two individuals do use um, uh, tactile sign language. And we'll talk about what to do with someone who's more low vision, where they don't need to communicate tactilely, but they probably need to communicate um, close proximity. So they still need that interpreter or that person who's signing um, fairly up close. Okay, so for an in-person meeting, um, again, same thing, you would want to send the agenda out of head of time and paperwork so that they have a chance to review it. Now, if the individual is a Braille user, uh, if they rely on Braille, uh, you can, you, you'll need to ask the individual, does it help if you send it electronically because they have what's called, uh, they may have what's called a braille display. And so they can access uh, electronic um, information via this braille display off of their computer. So again, uh, check in with the individual to see what um, accessible format that they need. You will also need to require or um, secure an ASL interpreter, again, about two weeks in advance uh, for the meeting. Um, uh, now, lighting, if the, if the individual does have some vision, lighting is critical here. Uh, so again, you'll have to talk with the individual about where they need that lighting to be. And it's different for everybody. There is not one, um, formula that, that meets the needs of everybody. Now, if the, so because the individual, if they have low vision, so you as the, um, the, um, the person who's doing the intake and the interpreter, the, just under, 
understand that the proximity will be a lot closer. So this might not fit the um, six feet requirement. And so it may require um, a closer distance. And just be aware of that. So the interpreter and the deafblind individual may need to sit closer. You and other staff probably could sit further apart. Um, that individual just needs to make sure they have access to the interpreter. It would be helpful if you could wear the transparent mask, again, just to show that you're trying to be accessible. It's also important that you um, take turns um, when speaking and um, identify who is speaking. Now, if the individual is uh, tactile based, um, they that interpreter will need to sit side by side and um, so they are touching one another. And that's just um, known and a given for um, deafblind individuals and the tactile interpreter. Now, when meeting remotely, this is where it gets to be a little bit tricky. Um, so um, I just realized we are running out of time. Okay, so um, I don't have time to get in all of uh, in oh, in all the logistics of someone who's deafblind and low vision. Um, and trying to do this remotely. So this is where it becomes more of a challenge. If you are interested and want to know more, please contact um, Chris and I, and we can uh, talk you through that and how that looks. So uh, we'll just quickly move through the next slide because um, I also want to leave time for questions. Hold on one second. Um, Wendy, I was just checking the chats. And there's a question asking if your agency has capacity for referrals. Uh, this is Wendy. Um, yes, yes, we do. Um, I just want to mention, so at the end here, we have links uh, to resources. It talks about how to work with people who are deafblind, especially remotely, um, CART services uh, with the uh, hearing loss. Um, some local agencies that can provide more information. Um, so please uh, feel free to go through those links and that will give you more information. And, and this resources. is Chris. Uh, this is Chris, if I could just add in, um, there was a question about how to uh, contact local interpreting agencies and where you would find that on the, this resources page is under the Minnesota Deaf and Hard of Hearing Services Division. Um, that will provide you contact information, but then just a few down, um, how to find and work with interpreters. That's also a really great resource. Thank you for the questions. We have just a couple of minutes left. Are there other questions that people would like to either put in the chat or the Q&A? Are there any that I missed that I didn't get answered? And if you want to be unmuted to ask a question verbally, you can hit that raise hand button and I will try to catch you. And we'll just give it some time here to make sure that if you are typing out a question that you have time to type that out. As we mentioned before, Danielle is going to be sending out um, to all participants the recording of this, so you should have access to uh, the PowerPoint. If you are specifically interested in the just having the PowerPoint itself, um, I'm not sure if you can access the links that we put on the PowerPoint via the recording. Um, so if you yeah, can't, I feel free to reach out to us. Yeah, this is Danielle. I don't think you're going to be able to click on the links on the video from the training. So if you really want some of those, um, you could just respond to one of the emails that I've sent and then I can um, get that from Chris and Wendy and send it to you or feel free to reach directly out to them too. And we just, while we're ending here, wanted to say thank you and teach you how to say thank you. All right, thank you so much, Chris and Wendy. Um, this was super interesting. I know I learned a lot. Um, so thank you very much for taking the time to share all of this knowledge with us today. And thank you for all those who joined us. 
Um, remember, a reminder that we will have our next session this coming Thursday at noon. Um, the session will be called It's Not You, It's Me, Breaking Up with Outdated Beliefs Using the Social Model and Disability Rights. And Ali Strong Martin from LifeWorks will be presenting that. Um, so hope you all hope to see many of you back here on Thursday. Thanks and enjoy the snowy day. Great. Thank you. Yes, well, thank you everyone. Bye.